welcome to Social Europe Podcast. Social Europe is a digital media platform that promotes analysis and opinion on politics, economy and employment and labor. You can find us on www.socialeurope.eu where we publish new content five times a week from Monday to Friday. My name is Henning Meyer and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe. Hello everybody and welcome to what is already the 10th episode of Social Europe Podcast. Today we bring to you a speech by Lord Anthony Giddens, the former director of the London School of Economics and one of the world's leading sociologists. Tony Giddens' speech analyzes the social and economic transformations the digital revolution and other technological changes are about to bring upon societies. You will hear Tony Giddens refer a few times to myself because I spoke just before him. But unfortunately there was a problem with the audio recording, so we will have to bring you my speech at a later stage. I, I don't know what Henning said, so you'll forgive me. There's clearly some overlap, and I'll zap out one or two bits where uh, it overlaps with what Henning's already said. I mean, to me, this is the greatest period of technological innovation ever in human history, in terms of it, certainly its pace and its global scope. Probably also in terms of its depth, and very possibly it's only actually in its early stages. But this is driven, as Henning has no doubt said, by a digital revolution. But to my mind, you know, as a social scientist or someone who works also on the front line of politics, the digital revolution is more or less at the moment completely unassimilated by the social sciences and by most people working in politics. I'll argue that this is partly because it's been widely misunderstood, but partly because it is quite hard to shift into the center ground, even though this is what we have to do. And I take it that was the tenor of what Henning was saying. A huge task, I think, uh, both in uh, analysis uh, and in practical policy making. If you want to you know, chart the difference, when the telephone was first invented, it took uh, 75 years to reach 50 million people. The first iPhone came out in 2007. There were some smartphones before that. But now it's reckoned there are something like 2 billion smartphones in the world. Nothing like that has ever happened before. Moreover, to me, this is the first time in human history that the most advanced technologies have gone directly to the poorer countries of the world. Uh, the, the, the actual number of mobile phones in Africa per head of population is greater than other continents, and the number of smartphones is advancing really quickly. I'd like to say, you know, this, this is already integrated in our everyday lives, and we kind of haven't noticed it enough to build it into the core of our theory. So if you look at you know, the wave of migration, people coming into Europe, especially via the Balkans, a lot of them are using their iPhones to navigate their passage, including people from Afghanistan, actually. They can plot where they're going um, using the GPS that uh, we all know will tell us where to go for anywhere. The smugglers so-called advertise on the internet like travel agents do. You can get pictures of where you're going. You can work out what the authorities are doing and you can try to outwit them and many other things. Look at the example of IS. IS seems to be a medieval theocratic organization reverting to the theme of women based on a hatred of women. But ISIS is using cutting edge digital technology. It's even been very innovative because Foucaultian beheading is back, public shame is back. Those things that Foucault said have disappeared are back in our midst. And IS employs uh, very sophisticated digital hackers, some of them trained in British universities, actually, to do what they do. So what's happening in Europe, in my view, is 21st century migration. And what's happening in ISIS is 21st century terrorism. And these are not simply replicas of what's happened previously. 
So to me, what we're realizing, there is some tremendous disjunction between the last 30 or so years of the 20th century, maybe going on the first five or six years of this century, and what the 21st century holds in store, which looks to be a period of shocks and dislocations, some of them positive, but many of them very difficult. And testing, not of course produced solely by the digital revolution, um, but with it as a key component. Now, I'd, I'd like to argue the digital revolution has been widely misunderstood in the social sciences and politics, and the reason for that is that it's been identified largely with the internet and social media. Now, of course, the internet is a completely extraordinary phenomenon, a game without precedent in history, really. You've got a level of global integration as well as dislocation, simply off the scale compared to any previous experience we've ever had as humanity. So I'm not downgrading its importance, but to me that is not the core of the digital revolution. The core of the digital revolution, I've become convinced, having spent the last two years studying, admittedly as a social scientist, not as a technical specialist, is the integra integration between the internet, supercomputers, and robotics. And supercomputers are the key connection between the two. I see supercomputers as the prime driving force of the digital revolution, because supercomputers give you this awesome algorithmic calculating power, which is now built into your iPhone, because your iPhone is more powerful than a supercomputer of about 30 years ago. Reckoned to be several times more powerful than the technology that took the first men to the moon. They were men again, now we're in the moon. So you've essentially got a supercomputer in your pocket. And the term big data is a really stupid term to me, because it sounds too hard edge. You're talking about amazing algorithmic power at everybody's disposal to live a just-in-time kind of life. This applies on a global level with the world financial system, instantaneous transactions for the first time, going everywhere in the world from anywhere in the world. That's never happened before and couldn't have happened before. Down to me finding this building. There's a reason I was late. It wasn't that I got lost because you need never get lost anymore. You don't even have to bother to look up where you're going until a few minutes before you go there. Um, so this is transforming our everyday lives at the same time it's transforming global futures. And, you know, it's important to understand the role of supercomputers because uh, they have powers, well, when combined with these other things, which only about 15 years ago people thought computers could never ever do. Everyone here will have read, I'm sure, the book, The Second, the Second Machine Age, probably the most famous book on all these things. Some of these things are very small slice them, actually, but it has several examples of, of tasks that it was thought by computer specialists only a few years ago computers could never do. Why well, almost drive a car, because driving a car is a stunningly complex thing. Now, as we know, driverless cars, they're, they're much safer than human beings, although... There is always a dark side. They can be hacked. We don't know what the consequences that will be if you try and build an overall driverless car system. All the main manufacturers are building driverless cars. But one of the break main breakthroughs was when um, the IBM supercomputer Watson beat a human being at the game Jeopardy. Everybody will know that Kasparov was beaten at uh, chess uh, years and years ago by Deep Blue, the IBM computer. But chess is mathematical, right? It seems fairly logical. Big computer might be a human being, even though it's pretty amazing. But the uh, Watson supercomputer um, beat the, the world champions at Jeopardy, which is an ordinary language, everyday knowledge game. No one would have thought that's possible uh, a few years ago, because the amount of everyday background knowledge you need to play that game something that we used to think only human, only the human brain could command. So this, this was another sort of massive stage in the evolution of the digital revolution. As everywhere, it has, you know, malign and positive implications. All of it's being applied to weaponry. A drone is simply a flying robot, after all, integrated with 
these other systems. On the other hand, Watson is doing cutting-edge research uh, in the medical frontier, and I've been doing a lot of work on this. It's quite amazing because of the overlap between uh, the algorithmic power of supercomputers and advances in genetics. I ask you to consider this, you know, we are just information because everything comes down to our genetic makeup. Computer is simply basic information, naught and one combined in fabulous ways. So there's a deep overlap between computing power, supercomputers and genetics. And in my view, there are likely to be really radical breakthroughs in the next few years. In frontier areas of medicine, I've been tracking some areas of cancerism amateur would do, not a medical specialist, but you can see a whole range of potentially radical advances there. So, I mean, you might think it's hyperbole, but I would say we're, tra we're talking about the transformation of everything here, and therefore a certain sense in which we ultimately need the rethinking of everything, which uh, Henning provided a very good sort of entree to. So I'll just zap through one or two things sort of quickly. By the way, um, there, there is a, a, a ro there are a whole variety of robot stand-up comedians now. I guess everyone's been entertained by one, but they're programmed to look at people's faces to see when they're showing interest, when they might smile. They make up their own jokes, and they respond to them much in the way in which a human comedian will do. I don't know if you've heard it, but one of the jokes made up by a robot comedian was that I once went out with an Apple device. It didn't work, unfortunately. She was always either this, either that, either the other. Well, I thought that wasn't too bad. Didn't get much of a laugh, but it wasn't too bad. And so, you know, more or less every domain is being transformed. And of course, you have humanoid, humanoid robotics developed in China and Japan. Well, very quickly, you know, this is eating away at the core of democracy as well as provided uh, possible alternatives to establish democratic structures. If you, most people here will know Robert Putnam and Susan Farr's book on disaffected democracies, the sort of things we see in Europe, and disillusionment with political leaders, suspicion of parliaments, uh, mistrust of politicians and political institutions, are actually turning out to be pretty universal. They find them in virtually all of the 18 countries, industrial countries they've studied around the world, suggesting there's something generic going in. It's not just disillusionment with the euro, or whatever it might be. And obviously there are many factors involved. I'm happy to talk about them, things I'm interested. But one thing anyway, I think, is that if you've got an iPhone in your pocket, you've got a smartphone in your pocket, Orthodox politics seems slow and cumbersome, and it bloody is slow and cumbersome. You can get information about any political leader you care to immediately. That strips them of any mystique they might try to create pretty rapidly. It simply introduces a new nexus into democratic systems. Again, a sort of huge mixture of opportunities, dangers, and risks, really. It's really interesting, a phenomenon of... Um, Mr. Corbyn in this country. I don't know how far people are following that, but I went to hear, I've been here a couple of times and Prime Minister's questions. That's like a fusion of the old and the new because he represents sort of a 1970s kind of radicalism, but he's got this whole new swathe of young supporters who've never been involved in politics before. They are basically a digital generation actually and have been uh, brought into politics mainly in this case through the social media, not a very deep thing, but never as important. So it's a very interesting, unstable mix, as it were, both of the generations in the old and the new. On the economy, well, Henning said it all, I think, really. You just have these huge transformations happening, as everywhere. You don't know what the consequences would be. There are two types of changes, primarily, I would say. Did you talk about the shared economy? No. Well, one is the shared economy, which is going to be huge, 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 I think, and is only in its early status. And again, I just offer you a little taster about that. 
that comes from this very interesting book I recommend to everybody here with a very unappetizing title. Um, the author is called Robin Chase. In this case, it's a woman, Robin Chase, well known entrepreneur in the US. And it's called Peers, P E E P E R S Inc. If I was, you know, I started my life in publishing. If I was a publisher, I'd told to get a different title. <laughs> Nevertheless, it's got really interesting stuff, and it's got quite a lot about the politics of these changes as well. But she gives us an example um, of Hilton Hotels, one of the biggest chain, chains in the world. Um, over a period of 95 years, the Hilton chain, 95 years, has amassed 610,000 rooms across the world. That's quite an achievement, isn't it? Well, you might think so until you look at Airbnb, which has overtaken this total within four years. It took 95 years to build it up, four years for Airbnb to get ahead. That is completely, I'm against okay it, completely stunning. And as you know, there are some interesting theoreticians around of the shared economy, because some people think, in a certain sense, it even marks the end of capitalism. I mean, that has been not said as something happening today, but something down the line, because a lot of the stuff is free. We didn't anticipate that. I mean, my partner is Chinese. She phones back to her family on Skype every day. She can see them on the, her device. So there's this new book by Paul Mason, you've probably seen the review, called Post-Capitalism, which agreed is a bit sort of eccentric around the edges, but it develops this theme in, in some part in a really interesting way, and there are several other major books that have been produced along these lines. What, what will a capitalistic system mean when many things are free? Where value, therefore, doesn't have the same connection as it would appear to have done in the sort of core of economic uh, theory. So I think it's a pretty huge change. Uh, the other one I won't um, go into because um, Henning talked about it very beautifully. It is simply the influence not just of robotics, I would insist, but robotics plus supercomputers plus the internet on middle level and professional jobs many of which are plainly lined up for the chop. As Henning said, just don't know how many. Carl Frey's estimate that you mentioned, about 47% of the American labor force. It's based on a fairly detailed examination of jobs, actually. But, you know, in, in the whole digital revolution, we're in don't-know territory in lots of areas. And I think this applies to politicians and citizens as well. So. It's an important part of it all that we're living in a don't-know don't world in quite a few dimensions, even though we've got far more information about it than ever before. And we just don't know where the new jobs will be created because, you know, on the whole, in the past, um, people have been very innovative in creating new, mod, new job opportunities. Where do you come from, Hannah? Where, where are you from? Germany. Yeah, which bit of Zala. Well, not sure that applies, but I mean, you know, one, who would have thought that you could use the mountains in the winter? Um, when people invented skiing, it created a whole new industry. We were thought to be mad to want to go to the mountains in the winter before that, so, you know, en masse. So, you know, there may be many analogues to that that could create jobs, but at the moment it's very hard to say. And... As Henning um, so well said, both these things have huge implications for policy. I feel at the moment, as I, I would repeat again, we haven't yet incorporated those. And I would tend to feel we'll have this session, then you go on with the other speakers, and it will go back to a kind of traditional orthodoxy. But I mean, you can't really do that. You can't really do that. It's, Everyone here has got a device, you know, most people don't even look at other people walking on the street because they're looking at their own devices all the time. So it's so deeply integrated into our lives. So I'll buzz, in conclusion, buzz very quickly through possible uh, implications for social democracy and uh, um, 
welfare systems? Well, the first is it's going to demand a fundamental thinking of, of welfare systems. So I agree with what Henning said about basic income. But you're going to have to deal with a really different world here. And it, it ain't the world of several decades down the line. It's the world of the next 10 to 15 years, actually. And it's probably happening globally, not just locally. So we're going to have to a lot of innovative policy, especially regarding people at the middle and lower levels of the labor force, particularly when it's so uncertain what will actually happen to them. So even though I agree what you said about basic income, uh, will demand, I think, a fundamental rethinking of welfare systems um, from quite a few angles. Second, it will involve the transformation of skills training, which I believe you touched on. I mean, you know, my party, the Labour Party in this country, has suddenly discovered apprenticeships, which you knew about in Germany a bit earlier. But I mean, the idea of an apprenticeship looks a bit vulnerable when you can have whole industries zapped out overnight. I mean, you know, I started a publishing company 30 years ago, Quality Press, and uh, when I started, publishing had to be done through compositors who set the type. It was a really skilled job, took years of training. Zappo, they were gone within 10 years, actually. No more compositors left because it was all done on computers. You could then typeset the books in China, wherever you wanted, immediately. The analog to this is happening all over the place, and it's unpredictable. As we know, quite a few industries have been zapped out overnight. So it would suggest we've got to put a lot of thinking into what skills training would be. I'm not saying that traditional apprenticeships should disappear at all, but this is going to, you're going to have to prepare people for an age of difference. And it's yeah. possible that social skills might count as much as technical skills in, in some areas. Third, I think we're going to have to look at a very active deployment of digital strategies in certainly core areas of the welfare state, but in other areas too. Um, I don't know how many people know, will know the book by Eric Topol, T-O-P-O-L, um, called The Patient Will See You Now. It's one of the most interesting discussions of the digital revolution and medical treatment. You know, when you go to a doctor's, you wait for about five hours and the reception says the doctor will see you now. So calling it the patient will see you now is arguing there's an imminent reversal of power within the medical profession because of the active deployment of digital strategies. I mean, people here might be wearing Fitbits. I certainly got one. It's just the early stages of monitoring of the human body with massive implications for healthcare. Fourthly, as Henning says, we're going to need a very proactive uh, policy on social mobility. I mean, I see just gigantic problems that are looming here. Henning kind of touched on them, but I think in a way perhaps even more profound than he was saying. Because you take someone like me, you know, my dad worked on the London Underground, and I got on in the world reasonably well, but at that period... This was a period of deindustrialization across Europe and elsewhere, and many new white collar jobs were being, being created. Now imagine the world that's looming almost exactly the opposite, where many professional and middle and even perhaps some higher level professional jobs are going to be destroyed. Where, how, where are poorer people going to go? The best book on this I know at the moment is another Robert Putnam book called America's Kids, which it's a very good sort of in-depth analysis, but if you've got a whole new mass of people who are not going to get anywhere in the system, because, you know, most mobility is not exchange mobility. It's not what um, sociologists call relative mobility. You don't get many elite people who move down. So mobility has almost all happened through new job creation. But if it's going to be the other way around, then... You know, you have to confront that. We're going to need some pretty proactive strategies. Fifthly, I think we're going to need a lot of experiments with direct democracy because when you live a more direct day-to-day, just-in-time world, you're just not going to be satisfied with some established democratic mechanisms. Unfortunately, no one has found a way that I've come across of producing a regularised form of e-democracy because things like citizen juries and so on have been marginally important, but 
we can't make progress on that. I, I think there are serious problems of democratic legitimacy, which are to some extent already here. Uh, sixthly, transformation of education, which I think is much deeper than Henning was implying, because you could have a transformation of the whole structure of education, a bit like you've had in other areas. In the university sector, we just don't know what MOOCs, mass online open courses, will do. But they could undermine the campus-based university, or at least large chunks of it. You can teach millions of people. They can be taught by the best people in the world, not just the best person on your local campus. You can find a way of funding them and assessing people. They could absolutely transform traditional university teaching. And the school system is already being transformed more or less everywhere by new technology because, again, Foucault is dead. I think, as a sociologist, one of the interesting things is the reverse of Foucault everywhere. Foucault said disciplinary power, you face a class, people sitting in a regularized way. Now, children work much more in circles, around computers, much more involved in sort of consensual system in which the teacher is not the last word because the teacher knows far less than you've got on your blooming um, computer. And then the end point is inequality. I think Henning is quite right. Gigantic issues around inequality. And again, the digital revolution, you know, is so deeply involved, people haven't really, I think, yet theorized it properly. I mean, this is the first era of truly electronic money. The portion of cash in the global economy is reckoned to be about 2,000 times less than it was 20 years ago. And cash has a different meaning when it's simply a load of digits in people's computers. So you're going to talk about Greek debt later on, but what the hell is deep? You know, Greek debt, so a load of digits in some bloody bank's computers doesn't have substance or flesh. And the fact that you can, you know, transpose money around the world instantaneously is amazing. So the issue comes, is Bitcoin just an experiment which will be doomed to marginality, or is Bitcoin the future of money? Because Bitcoin, as you probably know, does not depend upon a political authority to generate value. And some people see it as the future of all money. Again, we don't really know. And so far as inequality goes, you know, the, the rise of tax havens very much bound up with electronic money because you can switch money instantaneously. You don't have to be lumbering off with all suitcases full of cash anymore. But it cuts both ways because now the money in tax havens is much more transparent than it was before the digital revolution. So we know from the work of the consortium of investigative journalists in New York and London a lot of middle-class Greeks keep their money offshore, not just the super rich, but a lot of middle-class, even lower-level professionals do this. And we know where that money is. Can we get the authority to intervene into money sloshing around the world is, to me, a really fundamental issue of inequality in the future. We cannot have a world as we've got with these huge inequalities at the very top. We therefore must have action on tax havens, I think. You, the problem is you can only do it globally. Very hard to get global cooperation. There's no effective global governance. The EU is our best means of doing it, I think, working along with the US, because the US is pretty well motivated. What a huge difference it would make. And the fact that you can't actually access, you know, there is no privacy anymore. Anyone can get into your bloody bank account. You might not know it, but they can if they know what they're doing. So again, it's a very double-edged phenomenon. Well, I know, you know, maybe you don't, you don't like my jokes. I'll still finish with the joke because some, I, I check my passwords. I don't know if you check yours. You ought to. It's a revelation. I've got 38 passwords. If you include the hole in the wall for the bank, I've got three passwords for the parliament. They change every three months for security reasons. Handling that is pretty difficult. So the joke goes, I change my password to incorrect. So that every time I forget it, the computer says incorrect. That is much more subtle than you might imagine that at uh, first sight. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Thank you. You've just listened to an episode of Social Europe Podcast. 
you don't want to miss future episodes, please subscribe on iTunes or on Stitcher. Thank you very much.